Hello again, welcome to CG5042. In this lecture, we'll cover typing in VAS. Uh, so we have two sections, and we're getting onto the kind of stuff where we're going to be doing uh, content that is more suited to design calculations. So the, the previous stuff uh, on design process, etc. Sort of the methodology that we deploy, uh, we have the reliability side, uh, so understanding how that links into the design process. And we have the effects of corrosion and understanding that. And now we're getting on to how we size uh, pipes and select valves. And the bulk of this section is going to be taking up the piping side of it. Uh, the valve section is um, short enough. There's some quite descriptive stuff there. I'm just going to go through briefly how you, use, um, you, you size valves. And essentially what you do is you work very closely with the suppliers because uh, they, they're interested in helping you select it the correct valve for your process, and they will provide a lot of support, but you need to be sure and have confidence that the, the valve is right for you. Uh, so you need to understand uh, how valves work and appreciate what is the appropriate valve for a particular process. Now there's a whole slew of stuff out there, so it's beyond our scope to cover all of them, but I just want to give you a flavor of it. And so again, just expand your reading beyond the, the content of these slides. On the piping size, we're going to address how to uh, figure out what, how thick should the pipe be and what size diameter should I use. And then we're going to look at uh, developing system curves, and that's really the important step that, that we'll be focusing on is, is doing these calculations on system curves. That really would be a key takeaway learning outcome this is, is uh, to produce system standard. Okay, so that's our, our contents. So again, a bit like Babs. You know, pipes are standardized, so we've got an exhaustive list of standards out there. And um, again, being in Europe, if you're working with the European norm, the Brits may go out and do their own one again. Who knows? Um, if you're working in the US or are involved in a US company, it would be ANSI or ASME or in Japan, the JIS. And I suppose the key thing to remember piping is that it's, it's one of those kind of forgotten things, but a plant may well have several kilometers of piping. And the function of it is to transport the process streams between unit operations. So it's about moving your stuff around and doing that safely and securely and not taking too much effort to do it. And one of the things you should know is well, how do I calculate how much energy it takes to pump the fluid through a pipe? So if I give you a problem and I give you a flow rate and a pressure drop, uh, could you calculate the work required? And chances are you've forgotten that the work is simply the product of the pressure drop and the flow rate. So the pressure drop in the pipe times the flow rate. So again, these are things that uh, we've figured out how to calculate. And one of our main objectives in analysis is to figure out, we may know the flow rate, we've got to calculate the pressure drop, but we may know the pressure drop, we want to figure out the flow rate. Uh, and based on that, then we can calculate the fluid power required which is the energy that the pump needs to be able to deliver to the, to the fluid. So that's quite a fundamental thing, and you, you should be able to perform these type of calculations. And, and you should read that as that it's an expectation that you were able to do that. So this is, if you, have, if you don't know this formula already, uh, it is one you should know. You should verify that that is actually a um, chart. OK, so I mentioned already that we want to know what, okay, how thick should it be and what size pipe do I have. Excuse me, in terms of, uh, so if we oversize our pipe where it's too large, and we'd save on the pumping cost, but we're going to drive up our material cost. And if it's too small, uh, we've saved on the material cost and the pumping cost will become huge. And uh, you always don't want to compromise on safety. Remember, that is a huge thing. And you never, ever want to compromise on safety. So in terms of thicknesses, uh, you bear in mind that you're working to standard. So what you're going to do is you're going to calculate a re minimum required thickness, and then select a pipe that matches that thickness. Okay, it meets that requirement. And you may add on then a corrosion tolerance onto it. So again, these are design calculations uh, to help you select uh, a sufficiently thick pipe for your application. Okay, uh, this version here is 
based on the inner, the inner diameter, and this one's on the outer diameter. So. From a fluid's point of view, you're the outer diameter stress. And the working pressure that you're operating at, you're okay. So again, this formula here will give you your thickness and uh, you just factor on in the corrosion tolerance output. Um, something you'll often come across is um, pipe schedule number. And again, Typical things like schedule 40 or 80 would be quite common. And what the schedule number is, is 1,000 times the safe working press pressure divided by the safe working stress. So it gives you a, a margin there. And the higher schedule number uh, indicates thicker pipes, which are suited to higher pressure systems. So again, Schedule helps fix thickness based on a fixed and outside the cross that. Uh, you may see the use of different types of schedule, schedule number um, uniformly across the planet during certain processes. The pipe diameter is a balance between the capital cost and the pumping cost. And you know, there is quite a lot of piping in the plant and variably using roof stuff around. Uh, and it can represent up to about 20% of the capital cost. And we'll see this when you do uh, design projects and um, you're looking at the capital requirements. And as I mentioned earlier, smaller diameter pipes have less capital but more pumping costs. And you should understand why that is. Okay, why is the pumping cost higher with smaller diameter pipes? And that's purely because for a given flow rate, The pressure drop scale for a lamer flow is proportional to one over t to the four. Okay. So as you go smaller, your pressure drop really starts to, to, to ramp up. And if you multiply that for it by a given flow rate, then the energy required uh, drives up. Okay. Now, in the Peter's Zalal book, that's referenced here, uh, if you look at it, there's a derivation done on optimum pipe dimensions. And what I've done here is I've summarized the, the two of them. And we want for turbulent flow and one for lambda flow. And what they're reporting is the inside diameter. Okay. The turbulent flow one has, again, what that tells us is that you know, turbulent flow is dominated by inertial effects. So therefore, the density of the fluid becomes important. And in laminar flows, the density is not significant. It is dominated by viscous effects. So the fluid viscosity becomes the key parameter. So we see that the exponents here on Q are pretty much the same in both of them. But we have a change in the properties for turbulent flow. We have density because the turbulent flow is dominated by inertia. So we've got the density of the fluid becomes very important. So we'll go use words as the term there. And then for laminar flow, the viscosity is the, is the very important thing. Laminar flows are dominated by friction, fluid friction. So what these equations do is they give you a um, economically optimized for the situation for that you're trying to deliver the type of fluid. What you do then is that you select then an appropriate size based on that. So it's not that you kind of go, oh, say it's giving me a size of, of 147 millimeters. I'm going to go for a pipe diameter of 147 millimeters. You find one that matches your requirements that is a standard pipe. Uh, so it might be a 150 millimeter uh, inside diameter. And then you size your thickness uh, based on your operating pressure and your, your um, design stress, and then build on your corrosion tolerance after that. Okay. And schedule number then will help you with that also. Okay. So that's how you figure out what size pipe you need and how thick it should be. So some general rules of thumb, and these are useful for back of the envelope calculations or your preliminary design phase. 
The first is that for liquids, you want to keep the mean velocity in the pipe at about one and a half meters per second. You are currently the only person in this conference. Hopefully it's back okay. Uh, I just have to check that. Um, for gases, we want to keep the mean velocity, I mentioned around 20 meters per second, so in the range of 10 to 30. And then when we go to higher pressures, uh, it can go faster in the range of 30 to 60 meters per second. What happens in inside pipes? So when we talk about the velocity in the pipe, um, what we're referring to is the average velocity. And we need to understand where we are in the context of the pipe as well. So this side here, we do a picture of the entrance region to a pipe. So if we did fit the pipe up, uh, fit it to a reservoir, so say for example, a tank or something, or coming from a reactor, we have a flow stream coming in. Uh, it takes a while for the flow to develop. So what happens is, and again, you recall this from fluid mechanics, that the velocity at the surface is zero. And what happens is that we have this kind of flat profile that comes in from the reservoir as the fluid moves in. And a boundary are forms along the surfaces. So if I drop it in just down here, we find this boundary area is growing. And it grows from the other side also. And where they merge is the point where the flow becomes fully developed. And what that means is that if you take the velocity of the point here and you take the corresponding point downstream, the flow has not undergone any acceleration. So the velocity is identical. Prior to that, the flow has been reorganized. So it is accelerating. And in terms of the physics of the fluid mechanics, there's two very different things going on. In this entrance region, or referred to as the entrance length here, or the entrance region. The physics is dominated by inertia. So the acceleration is taking place, there's a transfer of momentum taking place. And our pressure drop is no longer important. It is the, the, the drop, sorry, the, I shouldn't say important, the, the driving force. It's a balance between in this region here between the inertia and the friction forces and in this region here from the in the fully developed region it is a balance between the pressure forces and the friction forces so we have two very different physical situations going on now we can see this when we look at the pressure drop through it we can see here that the pressure drop has this curvature on it and that's a, a, a characteristic of inertia in regions and here it is linear, which is a characteristic of uh, viscous regions. Okay, so we refer to this as the entrance length of the pipe. And then in this region forward, uh, it is the linear pressure drop in the fully developed flow. So we're using the kind of equations that we normally do for fully developed flow. But always in the entrance region, or anytime we have an acceleration in the flow, so if we go around the bend, for example, or have an expansion or contraction, uh, we would have influences due to inertia. Now, in macro scale systems, this entrance region can take up a uh, considerable portion of the pipe. And in laminar flow, there's a straightforward correlation. And again, it depends on the Reynolds number. In terminal flow, it's a weaker dependence on the Reynolds number. And again, with some values here worked out uh, for particular Reynolds numbers. And in my slides, uh, this should be 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, it's not from 1 to 4, 4 to 5, 6, etc. Uh, I need to correct that in, in some slides. So this is 10 to the power of 4, 10 to the power of 5, 10 to the power of 6, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, etc. Okay. Now what the round number is, is you recall that it's um, from fluid mechanics, that is a ratio of inertia to viscous forces. And if you have a high round number flow, it has quite a lot of mo momentum. And it's difficult for the surface effects to make their presence felt further in. So it's able to penetrate a lot further down before the walls get a chance to kind of slow the flow down and reorganize it. 
but therefore with higher rents numbers, uh, you have longer development rents. In the fully developed region, and this is something you would have covered in fluid mechanics again, we end up with this parabolic velocity profile. And it's quite a straightforward uh, derivation that you would have covered, uh, which I've summarized here. Okay, so the balance between the pressure forces and the shear forces or viscous forces. Okay, and we're using uh, the Newtonian definition for a fluid here, so a constant viscosity fluid. So what we refer to as Newtonian fluid. And we're able to perform an integration here to arrive at the solution to a fully developed velocity profile. We make this assumption that dp dx is constant, and that's the pressure gradient in the flow direction. What that means is that the flow, uh, sorry, the pressure is being pushed uniformly. And if it isn't being pushed uniformly, what it means is that the flow is accelerating, and then this equation is no longer valid, because this equation assumes that there is no acceleration. Okay, if there is acceleration, you need a much more complicated situation uh, set of equations, which are the, the neighbor Stokes equations. Okay, so these are a simplified version of them that just has a balance between pressure and viscous forces. So to meet that requirement, we need to be pushing the fluid constantly. So that pressure gradient is, is, a, is a constant. Okay, so then we can do the integration and we end up with this solution. Okay. And it links the velocity to the pressure drop, viscosity, and the size of the pipe. We end up with that, we can see this parabolic form of it here with the square dot. The maximum velocity occurs at the center line. So again, we have this expression here. And the minus sign is there because dp dx is negative, so that makes it a positive velocity. Now, one of the things that is used um, in terms of calculating the effort to pump a fluid through it is to use the friction factor. And there's a catch here in this in that there are two definitions of the friction factor with the Darcy one and the Fanning one. And historically, Cantor engineers would use the Fanning, and the Cantor mechanicals use the Darcy. Um, my background is in mechanical engineering, so I'm used to the Darcy one. Um, in fairness, both of them are used uh, extensively. It really depends on, on, on the person or the organization you're in. So there may be a history of using one. So just always be careful as to which is being used in the situation you're looking at. Uh, the fanning is defined this way, and the Darcy is defined this way. And essentially what it is, is it takes the shear stress and non-dimensionalizes it using uh, an inertial scale. The history of this is that fanning bases friction factor on the hydraulic radius. Um, and this means that the Darcy friction factor is four times the fanning. Okay, so there, there, there's room for error there that you can have, have your answer out by a factor of four. So just be careful of that. So if we go back to our expression for a uh, fully developed pipe, or sorry, fully developed flow in a pipe of length L, uh, we can arrive at an expression for the flow rate by integrating the velocity profile. We end up with this expression here. Okay, and we see that uh, the flow rate We've got this d to the four dependence here. Okay, so we can see how the pressure drop, if you rearrange this equation, is inversely proportional to d to the four. Okay, which we've done there. And again, we just tidied up the minus sign by uh, bringing the pressure drop term from high to low. Okay. So now, if we uh, make our definition for the friction factor, if we bring that into it, uh, we end up with the friction factor. In the Fanning case, is 16 over the Reynolds number, or in the Darcy case, it's four times that, uh, 64 over RE. And what we'll do is we'll use the friction factors to calculate pressure drops in uh, piping systems. Okay, so that's something that we'll come back to later on. The other regime then that we have is turbulent flow. And turbulent flow has this additional effect where there are no longer and streamlines that are calmly following each other and don't mix. Um, it's a randomly chaotic flow. And one of the things that we do with designers is um, we either work in a fully laminar situation or completely turbulent, and never, ever in the traditional transitional regime. 
And there's a very straightforward logic for that. Um, first of all, transition is poorly understood. Um, modeling is extremely difficult, extremely challenging. And what transition is, is it's not really a distinct region. Uh, the flow is lambda, and then pockets of turbulence emerge. And these pockets of turbulence are randomly distributed throughout the flow. And as you move through the transition regime, the frequency of the occurrence of these uh, pockets of turbulence increases and increases and increases until the flow becomes fully turbulent. So transition itself isn't really a distinct regime. It's as it moves from being in a lander state to a turbulent state, but it's oscillating between those states uh, randomly as it moves through it. Now the physics uh, that is going on with turbulent flow and lander flow are very different. So it causes an awful lot of challenges in terms of being able to predict what's going to happen. And um, all the, the random appearances of turbulent pockets causes massive fluctuations in the, the pressure drops in your system, and that causes um, dynamic loads in your system that just causes trouble left, right, and center. So a design guideline, uh, in fact, a design rule is that you stay away from transitional flow. You make sure you're completely laminar or you're completely turbulent. Okay, so you're trying to, trying to avoid that. So with turbulent flow, we've got a uh, randomly fluctuating flow, and this introduce, introduces um, additional stresses called random stresses. So essentially what we have is that the combination of the fluctuations, so when you time average the fluctuations, uh, you end up with additional shear stress here, uh, which are comprised by the time average of the product of the fluctuating components. Okay, so what we do with turbulent flow is that we make this assumption that the velocity is some kind of average value plus a fluctuating value. And we do that for the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. And when you make that substitution into the neighbor Stokes equation, you end up with this additional term here, which is u dash v dash and the time average of that. Okay, so whilst the time average of the fluctuating component is zero, if you take the product of the two of them, u dash and v dash, the time average of that is not zero. Okay, so there's an additional term that arises due to the nature of the fluctuating components. Okay, so when it comes to friction factors, uh, we're able to ex express a function, an expression for the friction factor in a turbulent flow on the pipe. And one thing we must bear in mind with turbulent flow is that the condition of the pipe becomes important, the surface roughness of it becomes important. Whereas in laminar flow, it's not important. So laminar flow is independent of roughness, whereas in turbulent flow, the roughness of the pipe is, has a significant effect on the friction. And the thing we use is the Moody diagram. And this is a plot that we use to determine the catalytic friction factors. So we have an example over here. Next slide. Uh, you can see that on the bottom axis, we've got Reynolds number. And on this axis here, uh, in this case, it's uh, the Darcy version of it. So we have the definition of friction factor. Um, and actually, one of the things we'll see in a while is that we're going to use this H term, which you can see here, uh, to calculate uh, the head arising. Okay, so we'll do, we'll base, based on the friction factor, we will then calculate a head loss due to that. Okay, so that's what we're going to so this is where I got this particular um, version of the Moody diagram. They're in textbooks. Uh, you'd have it in your mechanics notes. Uh, you can access them uh, online. Make sure that um, you're checking the variables. So it's Reynolds number on the bottom. And here we have uh, different roughnesses, uh, values of roughness ratios. Okay, so E or D. Okay, so uh, you can see that depending on the roughness condition, uh, we'll get smaller and smaller and smaller here. Um, that can have a significant influence on the value of the friction factor. Especially, uh, especially in the turbulent region. When we get to the laminar region, we have it here. And you see that uh, in the transition region, there's this huge jump um, between the data sets. Okay, so what you do is you just avoid that region uh, like the plague. So you stay well clear of it here, or you still stay well up there. Okay, so 
just avoid that transition uh, regime. Now, so based on the friction factor, which is what we calculate, uh, we then calculate this term HL. Okay, and what this is is head, which is expressed in meters. So very often engineers will talk about pressure drop or head loss in pipe flows, and then the two terms are used interchangeably. Pressure drop um, is our delta P, and head is simply that pressure drop divided by the density of the gravity, so delta P over rho g. Okay, so head is in meters, and pressure drop is in pascals. Okay. Now, for each region that we have, uh, so if we have a bend, a fitting, an expansion, contraction, an entrance region, etc., et we will have uh, pressure drops accumulating due to those. So the total pressure drop is the sum of the individual pressure drops in the system. So if I have a straight pipe that has a, an entrance, and it goes through a fitting, uh, it goes through a series of bends or whatever, and then to an outlet, uh, just So I would have pressure drops due to the entrance region here. Sorry, change the color. Uh, due to the entrance region there, due to the straight section of the pipe here, the bend there, the bend there. We may have an expansion here, a change in pipe diameter, so the pressure loss due to that. And due to the straight section, then we got the bend, the bend here. We've got a change in cross section, so pressure loss due to that. Uh, we may put in the valve inside there. We'd have a pressure drop due to that. Uh, an expansion loss up there as well into a reservoir. Etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for every component of the pipe, every time we have a bend or something, or a straight run of pipe, we would have a pressure loss associated with that. And the total pressure drop is the sum of all those individual components. Now if we look at this in terms of um, Bernoulli's equation, which you will be familiar with already. So again, this is a thermodynamic equation and an expression of the first law of energy, conservation of energy. So we have the pressure energy, the uh, potential energy, and the kinetic energy. Okay, so at state one and state two uh, is conserved. Now, with viscous effects, it's a dissipation. So we're losing those. So all we do is we add on this last term. Okay. So if we follow a streamline through our pipe, uh, what we have is this additional last term due to the frictional dissipation of the pipe. And what we do then with the friction factor is we calculate that and we calculate the last terms for every time we have uh, some loss inside the, the pipe section. Okay, so again, um, I've updated the slides in Sulis just because I had this equation in pressure form, I've converted it into um, it does form because it's, it's got H loss written in here, which is in meters, so head loss. So I've converted the pressure divided across by rho g. So it's the same equation as what we have here, uh, just divided by rho g. So this is what we use to calculate um, our pressure drop in our piping system. Okay, so pressure from inlet to outlet. So if you are in, in it take into the pipe and our outtake, these may be the same, in which case that would be zero. We may have no change in elevation, or we may have a change in elevation. Um, there may be a change in velocity, there may not be. So if you're starting from a large reservoir, that velocity would be zero. And if you're finishing in a large velocity, um, or sorry, a large reservoir, that would be zero also. So your pressure drop would just be comprised of the head loss terms. So what we do in terms of sizing pipes is that we pick our pipe size, and then we calculate what the frictional losses are in the straight section of the pipe. And then any fittings that we have, changes in cross-sectional area, bends, etc., we calculate the losses due to those. Okay, and they're given by this uh, K factor here. Okay, the K factor is something that you look up in textbooks. And we'll show, show you some examples of those. Now, from a design point of view, um, I'm conscious I moved through this quickly enough, but this is material you would be familiar with already. So what we're doing is we're looking at this from a design perspective, how do we use it? The K factors 
you would look up their manure fittings, we have our losses due to our straight section of pipe. Uh, we would have our losses due to our change in elevation. Okay. So that's something the pump may need, may need to overcome or due to working against the pressure or with the pressure. So from a high pressure system to a low pressure system, et cetera. Now, one of the things we'd like to do is from a design perspective is to kind of look at the relative magnitude of those and decide which term dominates. Now, if we're looking at just a piping system, we would look at say the straight section versus the fittings. We would look at the relative magnitudes of those and say, okay, well, which is causing me the most uh, loss in my system? Um, because if it's a problem, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna target that. So if my straight run of pipe is causing me problems, that's where I'm gonna focus on my design changes. Whereas if my fittings are causing me problems, that's where I focus on the design changes. Okay, so again, we start to interpret these numbers and targeting our designs uh, accordingly. Um, if all of these are small and were killed by a change in elevation, then we may need to consider, again, can we, do we need to address that change in elevation or are we constrained by that? So understanding the relative magnitude of these terms becomes So where do we get the uh, K values? So I've sourced these from White's Field Mechanics book. Again, it's, a, it's an excellent book. It's the one I recommend you should use. And uh, you should be able to get copies of it online. Uh, we see these are based in uh, inches. Again, uh, you get this information from manufacturers. They will supply it to you. So again, for a specific valve for pipe you're looking to use, uh, sorry, not for a valve, but for sorry, not for a pipe, but for particular valves, uh, you can get specific ones from manufacturers, or you can look up general ones. Here we have kind of bends and T's um, that we can get and see the range of K values, uh, depending on what type of interface is there, whether it's screwed or flanged or whatever. Uh, intake losses, again, depending on the shape of your intake, uh, we can see that the geometry has a strong influence. Uh, if you take the curvature, any curvature in it, uh, it really has uh, quite a substantial uh, effect on it and uh, helps reduce it down. Okay, so again, you can use these kind of graphs to look at that. Exit losses are generally unaffected and have a K factor of about one. So always take a K factor of one in your design calculations for the exit. And ultimately what we're after is this thing which we refer to as the system curve. Okay, so what this is, is a plot of pressure drop versus flow rate for my system. So it tells me that as I vary flow rate, how my pressure drop changes. And the form of the system curves is always of this nature. So at low flow rates, it tends to be linear. And at high flow rates, uh, it takes on this uh, parabolic nature, so squared. Okay. An example here of a high pressure system for this curve, a low pressure system here. So again, large change in flow rate gives a very, very small change in pressure drop. Here, small changes in flow rate give large changes in pressure drop. And this would be a, a typical one, uh, a moderate uh, pressure system. And really, our objective is to produce this system curve. And this is something you would be expected to be able to do. So you size your system, you size your pipe, and you design your, your layout of it with your valves and your fittings and your bends, et cetera, to, to meet your process requirements. And then you calculate what the system curve is. So how do you do that? But what you do is you select a range of data points at different flow rates. Again, if you go back to the slides back um, a good bit where we had the guidelines, uh, just back here. So for liquids, you're going to be in this range. So one to three meters per second, and ideally around 1.5. So if I go to slide 25, it goes. So here I would start with maybe 0.5, one, two, sorry, 1.5, two, 2.5, three meters per second. Okay, and I calculate then 
equivalent flow rates based on those. Now it runs through a series of calculations to produce this curve. So for one single point here, one single flow rate value, I will calculate what the pressure loss in the system is. So it's useful to set up an Excel table um, to do that. So I'd be using this equation here and converting that head loss into a pressure drop. Okay, so we do that for straight sections and that. If I have changes in elevation, they would add on to that. Or if I have changes in pressure, I'd be adapting this equation to if I'm working against the pressure or with the pressure. And this would give me one single data point for my system curve that I would produce. So we get our data point there, and then I'd repeat that process. So it's useful to do it in Excel. And cycle through maybe three, four, five, well, certainly a minimum of three, but you want at least four or five data points to get a reasonable effort uh, at that. And obviously that should be zero point there. Okay, and that gives you your system curve. So again, what I'm doing is I'm selecting the velocity, calculating the flow rate for that, and calculating a Reynolds number. I'm using a Moody diagram to calculate the friction factor for that. And then I'm calculating the head loss due to the straight section of the pipe at that velocity, at that flow rate value. Then I calculate the loss contribution due to the fittings and bends and elbows, etc., that I have in the piping system. And I'm getting those from the K factors. So I'm looking at the K factor for each component that I have. And then using that, multiplying by u squared over 2g and summing all those up to get the contribution to each of these terms uh, to the total uh, head loss in the system. Okay. Once I have that head loss, I'm plugging it back in here, and I'm calculating the pressure loss in the system between states one and state two. Okay, and that's what it's giving me that data point there. And then I repeat that process uh, to produce this curve. Okay, so this curve is, as written here, the single most important task that a designer is going to be able to do. And in your assessment, this is something that you are going to be asked to do. You're going to be asked to produce a system curve uh, for a particular system and then to look at the contributions uh, to the pressure drop due to the different components in it and get an understanding of those and how you're going to target uh, changes in your system uh, based on those. And what we'll see in, when we move on to pumps is that um, we produce a pump system curve. So pumps have curves that are sort of taking centrifugal pump. And where it intersects with the system curve is the operating point. And that's what that pump will deliver uh, in your system. So it's where the flow rate that will go through your system when that pump is connected to it. So that's something that we'll come to in uh, the pumping section when we get onto that. Okay, so again, just want to reiterate that this producing the system curve is something you expected to be able to do. So you should feel very comfortable at uh, being able to do those calculations using the formulas that I just showed you those there, and to be able to find the data for the different K factors. Again, just to reiterate, uh, I'll skip forward again to this. You select a series of velocities, so 0.5 meters per second if it's a liquid, 1 meter per second, 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3. Set up a table in Excel, calculate the corresponding Reynolds numbers, you calculate the friction factor for the straight section of the pipe, then you calculate the contribution due to each of the components, uh, which is this equation that we have here. So we're using that, the components inside there, so the bends, the elbows, the valves, the fittings, all that kind of stuff. And you sum all those together to get the total head loss in your system. You convert that head loss into a pressure drop, and you look at it in terms of the change in elevation, or pressure drops required for that, and the starting pressure and outlet pressure that is there also. Okay, and that gives you your total pressure drop for the system. That enables you to plot one point there, and you repeat that process uh, four or five times for different flow rate values corresponding to the 0 0.5, 1, 1.5 to 2.5 and 3 meters per second. So if you have any questions on that, just come back to me. Now, uh, other factors you may want to consider 
Uh, one is for thermal expansion, so you may want to put in a bellows or something, or some kind of a flexible expansion device that will cater for thermal expansion. Because due to environmental loads, your piping, the heat up or start up, etc., your piping may expand, and if your length is constrained, uh, it may want to buckle. Uh, allow for environmental conditions, so wind loading, earthquakes, vibrations, water hammer. Uh, what ha water hammer is, is the transient effect that causes pressure waves to travel through the system. So very often when a valve is actuated, uh, some of those old houses, if you actuate a valve, or shut a valve or a tap, uh, you have these um, pressure waves that bounce through the system. It sounds like someone banging the pipes and uh, it causes problems then for bends and uh, pump and tethers and things like that. Uh, what you can do is you can put in surge chambers to dampen these out. Okay, and then time transits to occur slowly. So gradually uh, close valves, don't do it suddenly, uh, gradually uh, turn the pump on, ramp it up, uh, don't kick it on straight away. Okay, I'll cover quite a lot there, so uh, you may need to go back over some of the stuff. The, the next section just to cover is on valves. And if we look at valves, again, there's something you buy off the shelf. And uh, they have three functions really. One is to switch, the other is control, and the other is to isolate. And you'll find valves that are tailored for those particular functions that are suitable for that. Uh, it's important that you size the valves correctly, because if you don't, what you end up with is uh, poor control over your system, uh, excessive pressure drop, and you can result in insufficient flow to meet your process needs. So again, getting the valve right is uh, quite important. What does the valve actually do? Well, what it does is it just regulates the flow by putting in an obstacle that reduces the flow area, so it drives up the pressure drop. And uh, you need to be careful about what kind of pump you've connected onto this, because if you have a possible spacing pump, uh, it doesn't really care what resistance it sees. And if you try and close it off with a, um, a valve, uh, the pump just keeps trying to ram the fluid through it. So that's something we'll come back to later on. So be careful of the type of pump that you have. Uh, but generally, pumps, if you restrict the flow, the, the flow rate is, uh, is, is killed, killed off in the, in the pump. But that's not the case for, for a positive displacement pumps. Now, we've had uh, different types of operation. We've got equal percentage, linear, and quick opening. Equal percentage is where if you change the valve opening by 10%, you get a 10% change in pressure drop. Linear is where it is directly proportional to the flow. And quick opening is where it is really fast. It goes from on off very, very rapidly. So you'll see those in safety systems. Um, if you look at kind of emergency shutoff valves, very often a quarter turn, so a 90 degree turn, brings them from fully open to fully closed. So the whole idea with them is that they go from being fully open, where they're not obstructing flow in any way whatsoever, to fully shut off completely tight uh, in one quarter turn actuation. Whereas uh, a control valve would have quite a lot of rotations um, of the mechanism to allow quite precise control over the, um, the flow going through it. Okay, in terms of sizing, uh, there's two things used. The CV value is probably the traditional one that's used in imperial systems. Uh, so typically in the US or some UK companies and KB is used in the SI world. So again, these are used to help size the valve. Okay. And again, uh, the suppliers will help you an awful lot in this. Um, there's some general guidelines. You operate control valves between 20 to 80% of their travel. Okay, so that's really what it's designed to, to be operated. And you try to keep as high an open flow pressure drop across the valve as a percentage of the system pressure drop to minimize the pressure shift. Use KV or CV to help size it, and you never use a valve that's less than half the pipe diameter. And again, another thing is you just check out the choked flow value for your valve and where you will operate in relation to it. Okay. So these are the key points uh, with regard to valves. There's then just a couple of slides on different types of valves. Uh, and you see that this is a gate valve, so a gate kind of comes across, it's introduced across the flow, it shuts the flow off. 
So as the this comes in, the flow is going to go down and around. Uh, so it becomes a more tortuous path that introduces a lot more uh, inertia into the flow and induces a lot more loss. Okay, so it kills the, the, the flow rate coming through. Uh, things to watch for them. Uh, not great for control, and you get cavitation occurring. Okay, and cavitation is something we talked about in pumps. Um, it's bad news. It's not something that, that's good to have. Uh, a glow valve, again, uh, very effective in control operations. Uh, you may have seen one in CG5011 when we do the, when you would have done the um, equipment dismantling. And uh, you can see here that it gives quite a tortuous flow through the path. So this thing tends to dominate the system pressure drop. And as you actuate it, it has very, very control over the total system uh, pressure drop. So uh, they're very useful for control purposes. They tend to, tend to be a bit uh, pricey. You can see their cutaway of the um, mechanism. So as you rotate this, this kind of plunger goes down and closes the gap off. So we have this kind of tortuous path uh, through the uh, system. Uh, another one there is a ball valve, again, useful for uh, on-off operation. So you very often see they have this quarter turn operation. You'll see them on gas valves and houses and things like that where you can shut on the gas supply very, very quickly. Okay. And the last one then to look at then will be butterfly valves, which have these kind of like a butterfly type shape. Uh, some of them are a bit like this then to connect the butterfly wing. The others are, have kind of a rotating disc like that. Okay. So. Uh, again, we've got some benefits and negatives on those, but they are the, kind of, these are the typical valves that you will come across uh, in service. And again, the suppliers will always help you do this. You just need to make sure that it's the right valve uh, for your operation. Okay, that concludes this lecture. Um, apologies over the interruption in sound, and um, just due to my internet connection here at home, which is far from my deal. Um, the key takeaway point here that I want you to be able to do is really on the system curve. And we have to, you have to be able to produce a system curve. Uh, the stuff I've covered on fluid mechanics here is a rehash of stuff that you've had already. And what we're doing now is looking at it from a design perspective. So what we want to be able to do is to understand how these terms contribute to the overall pressure drop. And really what we're doing is we're looking at the relative magnitude um, of these terms inside here. So in my head loss term, is it coming from the straight section of the pipe or is it coming from the fittings? If it's coming from the straight section of the pipe, what am I going to do? So if I need to reduce that, if my, if my value is uh, too high, well, one thing I can do is I can increase my pipe size. If I change the pipe size, the pressure drop depends on d to the power of 4. So that will have a substantial effect on the pressure drop. And it's linear with length. So if I reduce the length of it, I'll, have, I'll just decay it off linearly. So a 10% uh, change in the length will give me a 10% change in the um, head loss due to that. Okay. Whereas if I you know, make a 10% change to the pressure drop, I expect to see a 40% change in this. All right, so those kind of things become important. Uh, if it's a fittings, do I need to reduce them? Uh, kind of rearrange the, the number of bends and stuff like that? Or do I need to change the elevation if it's a change in elevation is causing any problems? So when you're targeting your design decisions based on quantification, and it's all linked back to the system curve and understanding what the system curve does. And when we come to pumping, and I mentioned this already, the pump interacts with the system curve. And we may also be able to change our pump to adjust it to operate better on our system. So that's something we'll cover in um, a future lecture next week. Okay, I've covered quite a lot of the material. If you have questions, um, just come back to me, let me know. Um, we might be able to set up an online session or something where um, you can dial it into Silvis if, if it's capable of supporting it. And um, I have my doubts about that. But um, if you have any questions whatsoever, just touch base and give me an email, and I'll do my best to get back to you in a reasonable time. Okay, uh, thank you for listening, and uh, we'll have another lecture for you next week. Take care. Bye bye.